Merry Christmas. My name is Lisa Tony, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm so excited to see you all today. And a special welcome to those of you who are watching online and maybe our campus at Arco, Idaho, or Kalispell, Montana. We're so glad that you could join us. Are those of you watching all around the world? And for those of you who are here as well, we're so delighted to have you here. And we have a special guest speaker with us this morning. His name is Dr. Mark Laberton, and he's the president of Fuller Seminary in Pasadena. Now, back a few years ago, 1998, this Midwestern girl in Michigan felt a call to go into ministry. Jesus very clearly spoke to me that um, he wanted me to go and train to go into full-time ministry. And I wasn't sure what that meant, but I accepted that call. I packed my blazer up and moved out to Pasadena, where I felt very much called to go to Fuller Seminary, where I spent the next three years of my life. So this is a very dear place for me. It's a place where I train for ministry. It's a place where I met Carl, my husband. We met in Greek class. Now, it really is the language of love. I know you think it's French, but in seminary, it's Greek. So that's where we met. So for both Carl and I, Fuller is a very special place. And when we began the discussions a few years ago that Fuller may be moving out to Pomona, of course, we were very excited. And so it was during that time that I got a chance to meet Dr. Laberton. Now, he was not the president of Fuller at the time that I was there, but since we've begun those discussions, I've had a chance to interact with him on a number of occasions. And as you may have heard, we've, we've shared the news with the congregation that Fuller is no longer able to move out to Pomona, so we are very sad about that. They've had some restrictions put on their campus sale by the city of Pasadena. And so, um, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. But whether or not Fuller is going to be three minutes away, which we had hoped, or whether they're 30 minutes away as they are in Pasadena, we're very grateful for the relationship that we've been able to form with Fuller and some of the wonderful people that we have met. And uh, Dr. Mark Laberton is one of those. He has been, uh, before he became president of Fuller Seminary, he's been in ministry for over 30 years. Uh, most recently, he was the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley. So he comes to us with many years of ministry experience. And as he took on the role of becoming president of the largest evangelical seminary in the world, such a, a great responsibility has fallen on this man to lead some of the most difficult conversations that evangelicals are having around the world. And I have come to appreciate just the integrity of this man, his, his thoughtfulness, his intelligence, his compassion, as he really really leads the charge of uh, navigating difficult conversations and culture in a way that represents Jesus and the church very, very well. So it is my privilege to introduce to you a friend of Purpose Church and my friend, Dr. Mark Laberton. Would you give him a warm welcome? Thanks, Lisa. Thank, you. Thank you so much for that very, very warm welcome. It's just typical of the experience that we've had over these last years when we really had been anticipating very much that we were coming here. Not only did we buy a portion of your property, but we brought other property in the immediate neighborhood, and we were uh, two days away from submitting drawings for all of our new campus, and then things began to change. So we're very sad that we're not coming, but I do want to say how grateful we are for the amazing taste that we got of this Pomona community and the, the wholehearted welcome, not only from, uh, from Pastor Glenn, Pastor Lisa, and others who are part of this congregation, but also from many others in the community that are just very eager for goodness and righteousness and justice to find its expression in the town of Pomona. And we love the hope and prospect of our being here. So it's been a huge surprise and change to us that we're not coming. We're adjusting to that and still actually grieving some of the implications of that. But we're also glad to be where we are. We love Pasadena. We're grateful that we've been called to be there. And now we're sort of trying to figure out what it means to come to Pasadena again as though for the first time, to try to see it in the way that only God can perhaps give us eyes to see and to engage in that community. So thank you for the privilege and gift that it is to be here. I think when we planned this, it was going to be a high neighbor kind of service where I was going to be saying, we're here or we're getting here. Now it's not, but I'm glad that we still have this chance to worship together and to give ear to what God might want to say to us this morning. As Lisa said, I was a pastor in Berkeley for the better part of uh, 25 to 30 years, and 
Berkeley is a, is a weird and wonderful place, and for me, it was just a fantastic place to do ministry. As unlikely as it might seem, it actually turns out to be uh, one of the most exciting places I can imagine to be. I, it reminds me of a story when I was in Berkeley. One day, I was walking into an art store uh, looking for something that I wasn't really uh, too clear about it. I wasn't sure uh, that it existed, and I said that to the clerk. I said, you know, I'm looking for something that, that's not only unusual, but I'm not sure it exists. And the clerk, without batting an eye, said, well, well, aren't we all? <laughs> it was a very Berkeley moment. Lots of moments like that happen in Berkeley. Um, I'm, I share that this morning because you don't know me. I don't know you. Uh, I have no idea why you're here. You may not know why you're here. You're just here. You may be looking for something that you're not even sure exists. There may be something, an, a hope in your heart, a hope in your life, a desire at least for hope, a hunger for hope. Hope for something that might land in your life that could actually make a real difference. We live in a context these days of extraordinary global fear. It cuts in so many different directions. It's true in almost every country. It's true for economic reasons and for political reasons and for religious reasons. It's true sometimes because of our own particular generation or because of our racial background or our circumstances, it may be because of circumstances of great personal need, interior concerns and fears, anxieties, or it may be because of circumstances around us. We all are people in need of hope and perhaps looking for something that in actual fact, if we were really to be honest, we're not sure that that hope actually is real or that it could land in our life. This morning, I want to pray that God would meet us, whatever questions or concerns or issues we might have in our lives, and that God would speak a word of hope to us as we look at this opening chapter of the book of Matthew. Lord, we ask that your spirit, who is here to be our teacher, will give us ears to hear. Our ears are so overwhelmed by the din of noise. Our eyes are besieged by visions of so many different kinds. But what we need is a word of life and hope that you, as the giver of life, alone can give. Help us to have ears to hear and hearing. Help us to trust you and to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. The text that I want to have us look at this morning is a text that comes from the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have access to a Bible or perhaps on the screen, you can see the text that we're going to be looking at. Matthew's Gospel is the first of the four Gospels, and it's put in that order almost surely because it's the most tied to the Old Testament, to the Hebrew Scriptures. It's also put in that place because the theme of Jesus as King is one of the main themes of the book of Matthew. It's a book that has a tremendously rich view of the Hebrew scriptures and of the way that there is a line of continuity between what God has done and what God is now doing. And in that way, it it is a gospel of the greatest traditionalism. But woven right through that is also this gospel that I think of as a gospel of surprise. It's the God who has spoken, is speaking, and is today continuing to do something that actually awakens us, shocks us, surprises us, disorients us because of the goodness of what God is actually trying to do. It's as though, on the one hand, the text says, it's all just as we expected. And then on the other hand, Matthew says, and it's not anything like what we thought it would be like. Both things are true. It's a little bit like the Gospel of Matthew is like a smelling salts gospel. It's like the gospel up your nose. Here, Matthew says, breathe this, and I dare you to try to sleep on this good news. This is going to wake you up. And if you walk all the way through the Gospel of Matthew with that sort of lens, I think you'll see over and over and over and over again that Matthew keeps depositing these surprising, shocking evidences of God's ability to do something that was in line with what God had done before, but was now a new reality. In the Gospel of Matthew, it begins in the most traditional Jewish way, It starts with a genealogy. Nothing could be more classically Jewish than that. And it starts like this. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's really like a kind of banner call. It's like a major headline that says, okay, pay attention to this. You can't get any better than saying to perhaps a broadly Jewish audience, this is about the Messiah. This is about the announcement of the genealogy of the son of Abraham, the most respected of all names in Israel, 
the son of David. That's the kind of genealogy that this is going to be about. It is blue blood through and through. It's the very best evidence of God's faithfulness and love. And then in a way that, frankly, most Bible readers probably skip over, we then have a set of verses that are the begats, the begat, the begat, the begat. And we run into that same thing here, and we certainly see it as we start reading in the opening verses of Matthew's Gospel. Hear this. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. The first surprise, Tamar. Really, we're naming Tamar in the genealogy of the Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Tamar, not a happy story in Israel's life. A story really of deception on the part of men. Deception that played their own political games, but took advantage of Tamar. Put Tamar in a very, very vulnerable place. And yet here she is. This unexpected name, this is not what would have been anticipated. No, women's names would probably not have been used, and certainly not Tamar. Tamar was not a chapter they were proud of. It's like the family stories that happen at Thanksgiving or at Christmas when you really whisper about the relatives that are a little too awkward to talk about at the table. (laughs) Tamar is one of those. You don't really talk about Tamar at the table. You can talk about Tamar in the kitchen or in the hall, but you don't put Tamar at the table. Now here in the telling of the story, Tamar, she who actually was the faithful one in the midst of unfaithful men. But suddenly, Tamar, an unexpected surprise. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Aram, and Aram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Oh, that's not what we expected. A harlot named in the genealogy of the son of Abraham, the son of David, the Messiah of God? What is this about? Why Tamar? Why Rahab? This person who in many ways figures so significantly in Israel's story, but not an Israelite. Not a person inside the tribe. Not a person whose whose name was held up when the family loved telling its great stories. Rahab, not the story that we would have expected. Not in this this genealogy. And yet this woman who plays an extraordinarily important place in the narrative of Israel's life. Tamar, Rahab, unexpected names, unexpected stories. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, again, a Moabite, not somebody who's inside Israel, not somebody who belongs in the family bloodline. She's, in a way, the interloper. Why would, why would Ruth suddenly be in this narrative? Not an expected name. And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah otherwise known as Bathsheba. Again, through no fault of her own, entirely through really the selective predatory behavior of this honored King David. Here now Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, by David, her name in the story of the genealogy of the Messiah of God, the son of Abraham, the son of David. This is as though Matthew is trying to say, so are you paying attention? Do you think you know what all this is going to be about? Do you think you actually understand how this story goes? Do you understand how the narrative unfolds? Do you know who the main characters are? We think we might. Some of his original hearers probably surely thought they knew how this story might unfold, how the genealogy is really meant to be told, but now Here suddenly, unexpectedly, are these names of these four unexpected women who are given a place of of exceptional honor, but surprising honor, because that's not the way the family tells its story. It's like the family suddenly now at the table saying, well, there was actually, remember this chapter, remember the one that we never want to talk about? Well, that's in the story too. And you remember this story over here about this other person who wasn't even really part of our family, remember that? 
Well, she also belongs in this narrative. Are you paying attention? Do you get that this is a story of of unexpected people? Of God now anointing through this unexpected narrative, unexpected people in an unexpected outcome that ultimately gets gathered up and told by Matthew here in this genealogy, which is summarized in this wonderful way toward the end of the genealogy when it simply says, and there were 14 generations, and there were 14 generations, and there were 14 generations, and it all looks so predictable, so calculated, so just as we thought it would be, until suddenly it's not like that at all. Tamar, really, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. These were not the honored moments. This was was not the drum roll that Israel was expecting that was going to lead from the beginning of time all the way through to the point where somehow God was going to provide what Israel had anticipated, a deliverer, a savior. But along the way, this story suggests that Matthew is going to tell another kind of story inside the story that we think is so predictable. It's a story of an unexpected, surprising grace that God will choose to use, whom God will choose to use, whoever they are. And whether they're in the family or out of the family, whether they're in the tribe or out of the tribe, whether they look like us or they don't look like us, whether they fit the narrative that we might have written if we were writing it, or whether they don't, God has a place to use unexpected people to accomplish God's means. Friends, this is This is why Matthew begins the gospel this way, to say, are you paying attention? Because if that's true of this God, then it's also a God who might have a story that allows us to be a part of it. We whose narratives had nothing to do with that story of Israel. There may be some here who have Jewish backgrounds, but the majority of us, I'm sure, come from Gentile backgrounds. We have no place in the story of the birth of the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Abraham, the Son of David. That isn't our story. That's another story. Until here, in this unexpected way, Matthew wants to tell the story to say, are you paying attention? There are surprises that have already unfolded, and there are more surprises yet to come. Now, in this very predictable way, it comes toward the end of the of of this story of the genealogy, the 14, 14, 14 generation. It feels like a nice, neat package with a bow on top, except for the surprises that were inside. And then, as though all of this was the setup to be able to tell us about how the bloodline continued in the birth of Jesus, then the story takes another unexpected turn. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way, asterisk. It has nothing to do with the genealogies that you just heard. It's going to be a surprise. It's going to be a birth that's going to happen in an unexpected way through a young girl, a Jewish girl, a young Jewish girl who is betrothed to Joseph, who's not married, who's not been with Joseph. They have no expected way that this is somehow going to create a pregnancy, let alone, as the text says says to us twice, is a pregnancy by the Holy Spirit. Now, I think that that's offered to us to be a source of assurance, but I think it... It's one of the strangest sentences in the whole Bible. I'd like you to meet my betrothed, she's pregnant, by the Holy Spirit. (laughs) No problem there. Pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Are we all okay with that? Do we understand what that even means? She's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. It is a jarring, disorienting sentence. Now, because we know how the Christmas story is told, and because we are familiar with how this narrative is is expressed and we realize how the drama has been played and will be played out, we sort of have internalized it as though it's normal. It just turns out it's not normal to say, I am pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That's not really the way it works. But that is the shock again. And therefore, it really doesn't have anything to do with Joseph. The genealogy ends in Joseph's line. And then the birth narrative picks up and it has nothing to do with Joseph making any biological contribution. It's just disorienting. God is going to do something that God is going to do. And God is going to use whatever means God wants to use to do that. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared 
to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. See, the shock of this is this is unlike anything that's ever happened. This is not a normal kind of circumstance. This is not another begat that just falls in line with other begats. This is an interruption of an entirely different kind, a new kind of beginning, a literally a kind of new genesis, a sense of a new creation that God is creating and initiating through this marginalized young Jewish girl who suddenly, though betrothed without relationships with Joseph, ends up being pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And it's not only that, it's that the whole purpose of this is so that this baby, whatever it is that's going to occur, is going to somehow lead to our salvation. That God will be with us as tangibly as a baby is with us. When a baby moves into a house, you know the baby is there. The baby is with us. And in being with us, in not only his babyhood, but in his life and death and resurrection, Jesus, the one who was born of Mary, pregnant by the Holy Spirit, betrothed to Joseph, that Mary is going to deliver to the world a baby who is Christ the Lord. Again, in our own cultured way, whether we're people who think of ourselves as Christians or whether we're not, whether we're at the margins of the church or whether we're just curious, whether we're here with mostly doubts or whether we're here with some kind of faith and history of trust, this is a disruptive text. This is meant to be a shock. And as Matthew's gospel unfolds, you'll continue to see how it continues to be shocking. Every step along the way, there is surprise. And now here at the very beginning of the story, I want us to just think about what this gospel of surprise actually means to us. That God is going to use whoever God will choose to use, as the women in the stories of the genealogy so clearly indicate. And now, God will use whatever means that have never even been imagined to now accomplish a work of God's presence and God's salvation, which can only happen through Jesus Christ. Friends, I don't know where you are today and whether or not this story in its familiarity just seems so familiar, it's impossible to get beyond it. I, I hope that there's a glimpse today and in this season of a wakefulness to a different way of understanding this gospel. It is not a domesticated gospel. Annie Dillard was right when she said that if we understood the power of God that's at work in the world, we would need to put seat belts in the pews and crash helmets for our heads. Because the reality of what God is doing is so much more vivid and tangible and disorienting, reorienting than we would ever think. Church is often a place that's designed over its millennia to become a place that often feels like cultural domestication. It's a place where we sort of quiet things. If we understand the nature of the gospel, it's a place that's meant to crack open the universe. It's meant to be the place that reorients us, that awakens us to the reality of God and God's surprising work that is meant to make all things right. It just turns out that whatever we're looking for this morning, not all things are right in us, in me or in you, and by no means are all things right in the world that's around us. It is a place of extraordinary turmoil and pain and division and suffering, injustice and a lack of mercy and a lack of sometimes the most basic kindness, a lack of understanding and seeing one another truly through the eyes of the God who has placed God's image on each of us. That is a, a remarkable chaos and into that kind of real, painful chaos, there is a new thing that God has done in Christ, which God is still not yet finished doing. But it's going to be disruptive to us. I grew up outside the life of the church. My dad was a scientist and an inventor, a person who really uh, was a wonderful dad, but he saved certain neck veins for the discussion of religion because he wanted to make sure that his two sons had nothing to do with religion. Well, you can see this didn't end up turning out too well for my dad. The surprise to me was that his great critique 
was this. He said, avoid religion and avoid religious people. Because what they do is they take great things and make them small. If you want to be a person of imagination, if you want to be a person who wants to live to try to make some sort of significant contribution, if you want to live free from the kind of myopic, petty little stuff that goes on in church or in religion, have nothing to do with it. Now, as a pastor for 30 plus years, I can say, God's not so wrong about that. There's a lot about religion, a lot about religious practice that can be very domesticating that can actually shut us down rather than open us up to the reality of God. What stunned me when I started reading the Gospels was that Jesus understood the danger. He talks a lot, as my dad did, about the danger of religion. But what he did instead was to say, the antidote to that is is not to avoid religion. The antidote to that is to discover the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God that actually cracks open the whole universe so that we have some entree of understanding and and access to the reality of God's purposes across time and around the world, throughout the universe. A God of endless imagination, a God of incredible compassion and mercy, who wants us to discover that reality and live in light of the enormity of God's gracious, capacious, wide embrace and his deep and profound power and mercy and justice that sets things right. Enter, Jesus says, the kingdom of God. That is the shock. But it will cause us to be disruptive. It was hugely disruptive to me. My life was set in one direction, and it became an entirely different life as a result of that shocking discovery that God was doing this new and unexpected thing. It's continued to be that way. I think of a man who once appeared at my door when I was in Berkeley who introduced himself quickly, just said, you know, I'm very successful, I'm very powerful, I have a lot of money, I don't have much time. Can I have five minutes? I said, wow, that's quite a self-introduction. Uh, yeah, by all means, what's, what's up? He said, well, my wife has been coming to this church. She comes home and she talks about Jesus. I don't really know anything about Jesus, so I just thought I could come along for maybe some quick bullet points about Jesus, and it would just help at dinner if I just had some kind of basic keys to Jesus. I said, well, I do understand the problem. That can really be difficult, I'm sure. I said, the thing is, though, if I gave you bullet points and the bullet points made sense to you and they seeped their way into your life, you'd have to rethink your power and your money and your success and your relationship with your family and your relationship with your wife. I'm not sure that I really want to do that. You don't want me to mess up your life. Oh, I totally don't want you to do that, he said. I said, I know. So, so why don't we just brainstorm? If she brings up Jesus, how do you move from Jesus to talk about football? I mean, whatever it is that you're going to be comfortable with, we could just figure out a way. Jesus, he brings up Jesus. We could figure out how to move the conversation to something more comfortable. He said, no, 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 I'm, I'm serious. I said, oh, so am I. I mean, quite literally, I'm not, I don't want to mess with your life. It's, it's quite clear that you're comfortable with your life, that you really like what you have, who you are, what you're doing in the world. And if we get into the Jesus thing, it's, it's going to, well, it's not going to be tidy. He said, what if I came back for an hour? I said, well, you know, an hour is sort of like a, a fat bullet point. I'm not sure that that's going to really <laughs> help very much. He said, what if I came back for two hours? I wasn't biting. He said, okay, listen, I, I never do this, but what if I came back for a whole morning? Well, that was sort of irresistible for me. So I said, yeah, okay, a morning. So the morning was set aside. He rolls up. This is not a person who had a latent spiritual hunger. <laughs> This was not a person who, once you got through the initial layer of obstructions, that really he was just longing for God. He had no interest in God. There was nothing that was going on there that I could discern spiritually. But at the end, he said he wanted to come again. So let's come again. So we had met another time. And each time he told me, now don't ever expect me in church. I don't really like churches. I don't try never to go into a church. I said, I understand. I feel that way sometimes myself. <laughs> so... He said, he said, okay, just don't expect it, but I'll see you the next time. Well, then suddenly, there he was in the third row. I thought, oh my gosh, dinner must have gotten really bad. What is happening now that he's there in church, in the third row, in public? Like, this is not something this man would do. So after the service, I was anxious to chat with him. And he, he said, uh, I said, you know, I'm so surprised to see you. He said, I know. Have I told you that I don't like coming to church? I said, yeah, I've, I've heard that. He said, okay, well, look. And then he just absolutely crashed into my arms and just was overwhelmed emotionally. I said, what's what's up? He said, I have no idea what's up. I was visiting something in the East Coast. I 
I heard about this one building. It happened to be a church, but I don't really like churches. I went into this building. I'm just sitting by myself in this little side chapel. And all I know is I, I think that God just came to me. And I don't even know that there is a God, let alone that that God could come to me, let alone that that's what that was. But I, it's just really complicated. I said, I know, and it's going to get worse. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is going to be a whole lot messier before anything is made clear to you. And over the course of the next four or five years, this man underwent one of the most amazing, quiet, but deliberate and evident transformations. And it required rethinking his power and his money and his stature and his job and his relationship with his family. He is a new person because the God of surprise met him. One day I got a call from a woman who said, you know, I'd like to come and see you, but you have to agree to certain terms before we could meet. I said, okay, what are the terms? She said, well, I've never met you. I'm not comfortable in a church building. Uh, I'd like to meet on public premises. I'd need to be outside because uh, I, I just need to be able to vent a lot. I have a lot of things I need to get off my chest. I need to be able to scream and swear and smoke. I need to be able to pace. I need to just like have a lot that I need to get off, uh, off of my life. I said, wow, um, maybe just one little question first. Do you have a gun? <laughs> I was slightly heartened when there was a little chuckle I thought I detected just before. She said, mm, I don't expect to. I thought, okay, well, that may be as good as I can get. So we roll up to this agreed-upon park, and it just took the first few minutes before the gusher of all that she had suffered began to just pour out. She was entitled to every feeling she had. She was entitled to every swear word she needed to declare. She was entitled to express everything that was in her. And I tried just to listen and to try to understand what it was she was describing. It was a remarkable conversation. She wanted to meet again, and because this was at a park, and you know how parks, there's a bench here, and then there's another bench about 20 feet over there. She would never sit on my bench, but she would sit on that bench, and she would yell the most amazing, intimate details about the things that she had suffered from 20 feet away. I, I kept saying, you know, really, I could stand, and you could sit here. I could stand closer to where you are. I mean, no, 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 this is just fine, she said. It's just fine. You stay over there. I'll stay over here. We met several times like this, and we set up the next time, and just as we were about to do so, she said, you know what all this comes down to? I just need to know this. Is there somewhere in the universe a God who is not a man and who loves me and could actually heal me? That was the start of what I hoped was a turning, and I was in anticipation of our next conversation. I showed up where we were supposed to meet at the right time, and she didn't appear. I eventually called her, and uh, there was no answer. In fact, it seemed her phone had been disconnected. I went to the only address I had for her, and she had already moved out, and there was no forwarding address. I had no idea what had happened to her. I knew no one who knew her, so I didn't have any way to try to find some sort of connections. I talked to people in the building that she lived in, and nobody was aware of where she had gone. For a long time, I just kept praying for her and thinking, maybe we'll just reconnect somehow. Eventually, the internet comes into existence. That's how long ago this was. And I would periodically type in her name to try to see if I could find her. It was a somewhat unusual name, so I thought maybe it might appear. It didn't ever appear. Five years go by, 10 years go by, 15 years go by, 20 years go by, 25 years go by, and no word. I moved from Northern California to Pasadena. I'm at a coffee shop in Pasadena. There's a change jar, which in this case is a contributions jar, and next to that was a slip of paper that described some things about Burma, Myanmar. And I know a fair amount about Myanmar, so I was reading all this, finding it really interesting, and at the bottom it said, and if you want more information about this, you can contact me, and it gave the first initial and the last name of an email address, which happened to correspond to this person. I thought, oh my gosh, could it possibly be? So I quickly sent an, an email wondering, you know, I, I'm not sure you would remember me. It was a long time ago, 25 years. Could you be this person that I knew and talked to in Berkeley? And I sent the email and just kind of froze at my screen, hoping that she would respond. In a couple of hours, she did respond. She said, 
uh, yeah, that's me. I do remember you. I I'm surprised that you would remember me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, it's not really at my surprise. That no, 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 I, I have no problem remembering you. Uh, I'm just wondering, how are you? Where are you? Etc. Where are you right now? I'm in the Sierras. Why are you in the Sierras? She told me why. I said, where do you live? She said, I live in Pasadena. I said, you live in Pasadena. Why are you in Pasadena? Because I'm a student at Fuller Theological <laughs> Seminary. You're a student at Fuller Theological Seminary. Why would you be a student at Fuller Theological Seminary? She said, well, that's, that's a long story. A couple months later, she came back to Pasadena, and we arranged to meet. My heart was pounding because it was so disorienting to have a chance to meet this person that I had thought about, whose story was so painful, and I had known nothing about for 25 years. She was a new person. God had interrupted and healed her pain. She knew that there was a God in the world who was not a man and who could love her and heal her. And that's what God had done. And she was at Fuller because for the previous couple of decades she had been working in Southeast Asia among extremely vulnerable women and girls she was giving away a gift of grace that had landed deeply in her life through a pathway that happened between our conversations and the time that we remet. And here's this person who is the same spunky, thoughtful, bright, passionate person that she was, but now a person that's healed, renewed, made new because of Jesus Christ. An extraordinary story of grace. See, the thing about this season is that it, we think we know just how the season goes. There's the drum roll that plays up to the 25th, and there's even more sales, and then we have this, uh, the hallelujah chorus over the New Year's, and then we are done, and then we call that the Christmas season. Well, in the language of Matthew, the Christmas season is not that. It's the story of this shocking interruption in history of God coming in human flesh to be with us, Emmanuel, to save us, to deliver us. You as a congregation, you who are probably part of this congregation regularly, and some of you may only be visitors here this morning, I just want to say to you, I hope that this Christmas is for you what I certainly know that I need it to be for me, which is another experience of the surprise of a God who knows us and pursues us and delivers us from ourselves. Once I was speaking at an event that had such bright lights on the stage that, that there was n almost no one that I could see, but there was a really large video monitor here that had an image of me. And then over here, there was another really large video monitor that had another image of me. And then, of course, there was me. So there was me and me and me. I thought, this is sort of the postmodern trinity. <laughs> this is... This is the world I was made for, where everything and everyone is really about me and about my desires. We're all on the same page. We're all in total agreement. We're all going to do the same things. That's called a prison of sin, a narcissistic prison of self-interest. Christmas is meant to interrupt that, to deliver us from ourselves, our bitterness, our prejudice, our blindness, our hatred, our anger, our fury, our emptiness. It's a God who interrupts us with the good news of a God who is so with us that he takes on human flesh and moves into the neighborhood. May it be an encounter with that God that you experience, that I experience, that the thousands of people that may come to Bethlehem here over the next week be an experience of a God of shocking surprise, a God who wakes us up to God, to the people that we are actually meant to be, to the love that we are actually meant to know and to embody and express to the world around us. How will Pomona know that there is a God like this? By that God showing up in your life and you showing up in the lives of other people with the evidence of this surprising news. Lord, by your grace, do this good work. Purpose Church is here, 
not just for wonderful programming and great opportunities for easy fellowship and for new kinds of connections. It is for here for those things, but it's also here for this deeper, unexpected shock of a gospel that is under no one's capacity to tame, which does not look like me or anyone else in this room. It looks like you. It's a gospel of your shocking, disorienting, hopeful love. I, oh God, I need, I need that hope today. And for any who are here today, may the hope that is in you be a gift that we receive today because of Jesus Christ who saves us. Amen.